Welcome back. So as I was saying, the anticoagulants, the most serious adverse effect or most uh, frequent as well as potentially serious adverse effect is bleeding. So the patient needs to be observed for signs of hemorrhage. Now this bleeding can be localized hemorrhage or it could be systemic hemorrhage. So we observe them for things such as bruising, bleeding gums, blood in their urine or stools. If they've had any traumatic injury, then they're especially at risk if they're already on an anticoagulant. So any symptoms of bleeding must be reported immediately to their healthcare provider. The anticoagulants can also cause a thing called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia that's specific to heparin. Now, they may have symptoms like nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, other symptoms that they might not pay attention to or recognize as bleeding. So we have to be sure that they use uh, utmost caution and that they have excellent patient education with regards to the anticoagulants effects, the signs and symptoms of bleeding, as well as when and how to report to their provider. So one of the things that we monitor with the anticoagulants is bleeding time. And the way we do that with heparin is by monitoring the activated partial thromboplastin time, or the APPT. You'll hear it shortened to PTT. Uh, heparin is parenteral, so it is either given subcutaneously or intravenously. It has a very short half-life of about one to two hours. And to reverse the effects of heparin, we can give protamine sulfate. With our low molecular weight heparins, these are Lovenox or Anoxaparin and Daltaparin. Uh, or fragmin, these have a more predictable anticoagulant response. So they don't require the intense laboratory monitoring that we have with heparin. They are given subcutaneously. One of the things about giving the heparins, whether it is the subcutaneous heparin or the low molecular weight heparin, is that we do not rub the site after administration. The subcutaneous uh, administration can, if we rub that site, can cause hematoma and bleeding at the site. Warfarin sodium or Coumadin is given orally only. This medication is monitored using a protimin INR. You will hear it referred to as a PTINR. There is research now that renders the PT basically as a ineffective or not ineffective but outdated method of monitoring the the use of Coumadin and because warfarin is the most widely used oral um, anticoagulant in the still in the United States it is um, important that the patient understand that they'll need to have their INR tested and monitored routinely now the reason it's still the most widely used um, anticoagulant orally is because it has good absorption or good bioavailability. It has a relatively predictable onset of action. It has a long duration of action. And we've had it around for so long that we have proven uh, its efficacy. That being said, we also now know that genetic factors have been identified that can cause certain patients to need either a lower or a higher than anticipated dose of warfarin. Because warfarin's metabolism is influenced by the protein cytochrome P450-2C9 or the CYP2C9 and vitamin K epoxide reductase complex, which is called the VKORC1. So this genetic mutation affects that warfarin's metabolism. And so it's important that we have stable INR and that we monitor the INR. Sometimes the patient's um, genotype is known and sometimes it isn't. I anticipate that as we move more towards personalized medication, we will see this resolved as a as an issue because those identification of the genetic polymorphisms will come along with recommended dosages based on those polymorphisms. Um, of course, one 
thing that does that really isn't um, helpful is that, <laughs> that genetic polymorphism isn't going to change uh, patients' noncompliance. So multiple factors have to be taken into consideration with warfarin, including restrictions of diet as well as monitoring for taking the medication and getting the INR tested. There are home INR test kits that can be used or test equipment. It's very similar to what one would use to register or to measure, <laughs> measure or register, measure uh, your home blood glucose, fasting blood glucose, um, that they are expensive and not all insurances cover them. Now, if we have uh, toxicity of warfarin, the uh, antidote for that can be, is vitamin K, and that can be given. The antiplatelet drugs, these drugs prevent platelet adhesion. These are aspirin, clopidogrel, or Plavix, um, uh, Blastigrel, or Effient, and Bril Brilinta, excuse me, are similar to procliticryl, um, terafibin or agarist, agaristat, um, integralin, and areopro. These are GP2B and 3A inhibitors. So when we look at antiplatelet drugs, they work in a little bit different mechanism. When we have our blood vessel injury and we get our vasoconstriction, our collagen exposure, the tissue um, thromboplast in factor two is released, and we then see the cascades start. The intrinsic and the extrinsic cascades occur, ultimately resulting in a decrease. This vasoconstriction decreases the blood flow, but we get platelet ag aggregation and a platelet plug. The thrombin and fibrin then, after remember, they come together and share the pathway after. Uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic cascades share the pathway after thrombin is present and the fibrin occurs. With these anticoagulants, the platelet aggregation and the platelet plug is what's affected because we are doing a platelet inhibition. So this is where aspirin works. People often will take aspirin for, re for uh, uh, conditions other than platelet inhibition. And so this is, remember, a side effect that we have to pay attention to when we have patients on multiple medications. If we look at the um, areas in which we can see platelet aggregation occur, the platelets occur and are mediated to, co to cause this aggregation that's responsible for creating the clot. So platelets, if you looked at them under a microscope, they're not slippery and smooth like your red blood cells. Remember, those are kind of a concave disc. And um, the platelets have little um, sticky pieces on them that cause them to stick together and to grab onto one another. So what the platelet inhibitors do is that they stop them. They make the platelets more smooth. They kind of round them out and make them more slippery so that it actually inhibits the platelet aggregation. The indications for the antiplatelets are to give an antithrombotic effect to help reduce the risk of fatal or non-fatal strokes in acute unstable angina and myocardial infarction. In fact, when we talk in 122 about heart disease, we'll talk about myocardial infarction and often the emergency rooms will have an acronym called MONA, which means when the patient comes in with a suspected MI or myocardial infarction, we will give them morphine. It's actually for breathing, not for pain. Oxygen to increase oxygenation to the tissues. Nitroglycerin, to vasodilate the blood vessels of the heart, and aspirin to work as an antithrombotic to prevent further development of clot formation. Remember, these drugs do not lyse clots. They do not destroy clots. So um, the antiplatelets, their adverse effects vary according to the drugs. And 
when we look at those drugs, let me back up there just a second. When we look at those drugs, we have to think about the overall picture. For example, like I said, aspirin, your NSAIDs often work as antiplatelets, but they work in a different mechanism. The way they work is through prostate inhibition of prostaglandins. And so these adverse effects are going to vary by the drug depending on what that drug is. With our thrombolytic drugs, these are the ones that lyse, the ones that actually break down the clot. Now, our older drugs are streptokinase, urokinase. Our more current drugs we see are um, altiplase. We'll see that one used quite a bit, or uh, retiplase. Um, these drugs actively go in and bust up the clot. They are very, they're very time-driven and they have certain criteria that have to be met. So there will be a very uh, protocol-driven uh, circumstances through which they, you will see these drugs used. The thrombolytic drugs activate the fibrinolytic system and they break down the clot in the blood vessel very quickly. So they activate plasminogen and convert it to plasmin and that digests the fibrin. So what happens is we have a reestablishment of the blood flow to the heart muscle through the coronary arteries and it prevents tissue destruction. We would be very cautious and there are certain criteria that, like I said before, we would not want to give this in the presence of, for example, a hemorrhagic stroke, that would make the situation worse, whereas an embolic stroke, it would be helpful. Um, you will see this used with an acute ischemic stroke or an embolic stroke, pulmonary embolism, when we have an occlusion of a shunt or catheter, and we're talking about a catheter in the um, like a cardiac catheter, not a catheter that's a Foley catheter or anything like that. Uh, deep vein thrombosis, arterial thrombolysis, uh, or an acute MI. Some obvious adverse effects are bleeding, and that could be internal bleeding, intracranial bleeding, and superficial bleeding. Other effects of these drugs can be nausea, vomiting, hypotension, anaphylactoid type of reaction, as well as cardiac dysrhythmias, which can be very dangerous. The anti-fibrinolytic uh, fibrinolytic drugs prevent the lysis of fibrin, and so they result in promoting clot formation. So these drugs are on the opposite end if you think of them in a continuum because they're used for the prevention and treatment of excessive bleeding resulting from hyperfibrinolysis or surgical complications. They're also used more, more frequently in the treatment of hemophilia or von Willebrand's disease. These are things like Amicar, DDAVP is a desmopressin. It's similar to ADH. You may remember this drug because we talked about it in LVN-122 when we're talking about diabetes insipidus. The adverse effects of the antifibrinolytic drugs are uncommon and mild. Um, rarely they will report thrombotic events, but it is a risk. Other things that can occur are dysrhythmia, orthostatic hypotension, bradycardia, headache, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, things like that, the GI system. So let's talk about nursing implications, and I'm going to try to go through these slides pretty quickly. Assess your patient's history. Again, make sure that you're looking at all of the medications that they take. Are there any contraindications to the medications that we're going to give? What are their baseline vital signs? Lab values, remember we want to be sure we're checking PT or PTT, INR potential drug interactions, and do they have any history of abnormal bleeding? Heparin nursing implications, our intravenous doses are usually double checked by another nurse. In fact, as a nurse a long time, I have never worked in a facility where heparin was not double checked. Ensure that subcutaneous doses are given subcutaneously, not intramuscularly. And remember that they are given uh, in deep subcutaneous fats, the sites rotated, and we do not uh, then massage those sites. Don't give the subcutaneous doses within two inches of the umbilicus, any abdominal incisions, open wounds, scars, drainage tubes, or stomas. We don't aspirate as well. That can cause the hematoma. 
Uh, looks like I'm going to run out of time, so we'll have one more go and we'll finish this up. See you in a few minutes.